This is Ambition Today. Today we are joined by Michael Diamant. He is the former founder and CEO of Skip Hop. This is Ambition Today. These are the entrepreneurs, creators, investors, and builders who ambitiously change to the world. Explore the hardships and heroisms of everyday life while we reveal the key moments to leave behind a lasting legacy. This is Ambition Today with Kevin Siskar. What's up, world? I am Kevin Siskar, and you are listening to Ambition Today. And the Ambition List, which is our new back channel, is now up, live, and growing. After every episode, we've been going longer with each guest and asking them one question. What is the single greatest piece of advice you've ever received? And tell us the story of how you learned it. This question has given us some amazingly deep and powerful insights from past guests, and you can get them all now at ciscar.co slash A-list. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast in your favorite podcast app, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Breaker, Syscar.co, really anywhere that you listen to podcasts, check it out. In case you missed it, last episode, we went all the way down under. We talked to Benjamin Chong from Australia. He's the founder and investor at Right Click Capital, and he's also the director of Founder Institute Australia. But today, I'm very excited. We are joined by Michael Diamant. He's the former founder and CEO of Skip Hop, uh, which makes many amazing products for babies and toddlers and, and young young uh, children. And so, Michael, welcome to Ambition Today. Thanks for having me, Kevin. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Where are we today? Let's set the scene for uh, for the audience listening out there. So we are in, in my home um, in Chelsea, in New York City, um, and uh, it's a great day outside. The snow is all melted. And um, yeah, looking forward to kick still, off a fantastic Wednesday. Yeah, it's still cold, but, uh, but thank you for having me. So let's, let's kick it all the way back to the beginning. Tell sure. us a little bit about where you grew up. Um, you know, did you have any entrepreneurial influences growing up? Where were you born? Uh, give us the backstory. So I was born in Brooklyn. Um, I was born in a part of Brooklyn called Sheepshead Bay, which is not the cool part of Brooklyn, but I thought it was pretty cool back then. Um, and uh, I lived there till I was about eight years old. Um, and at which point, um, my family moved out to the New York City suburbs. Um, and even though I've only spent 10 years of my life in the suburbs, those 10 years really do a lot to define who you are. You'll always be the guy you are. You're always, you're always from the place that you were when you were 15. That's what, you're, that's what I say. So, um, you know, I grew up in a family. I had a, my, uh, I had a brother. I have a brother. Um, and um, my mom was a stay-at-home mom. And my dad, for all of my life, um, ran his own company actually with my grandfather. They ran a, a a representative firm where they sold fashion jewelry to big department stores and chains and things like that. You know, I, I, they called it costume jewelry back then. And um, what was interesting is that my dad never had a boss. I never grew up in a house where my father worked for a big company. He never had like a guaranteed paycheck. Uh, he never would come home from work and say, oh, what a terrible day at the office. My boss is a real jerk. <laughs> and I think that had a real uh, influence on just me <clears throat> as a little kid thinking, you know, I never really thought about it too much. But when I grow up, what do I want to do? I never actually had this, this imprinted on me that life meant you had to have a boss or work for a big company. Uh, he also traveled a lot. He had a lot of worker clients. You know, he was a he, he ran a very very good operation, um, small small business, but uh, it you know it got us a nice life, put me through college, things like that. Nice. That's actually a theme we, we've seen is, is you know people that have had these entrepreneurial parents. Did, did you find that as you grew older that you didn't even maybe want to be an entrepreneur, or just sort of that that mentality manifested itself in you in some ways? Uh, well, it's interesting. First of all, I think if you asked my father if he was an entrepreneur, he'd laugh and say, what does that mean? I was just, you know, making a buck. That's, yeah, how, yeah. that's how he would put it. Um, you know, I think that, of course, when I was a kid, I wanted to, I, what I really wanted to do is work in advertising. I don't know why, but I wanted to work for an advertising agency. It seemed like it was creative. It seemed like um, it involved some sales skills. I like to write. It seemed like it had writing involved. But, you know, again, going to work for a company, which I ultimately did at first, is not something I had seen growing up. And I think, um, you know, I don't think my father not working for a, for any kind of big company, working for himself, you know, set, put in my head, oh, you're going to be an entrepreneur one day. But it certainly put in my head the possibility that you don't have to work for somebody else um, uh, in your life and, and support a family. Nice. So where did you go to university? What, what did you study? So I went to uh, the University of Michigan um, and uh, Go Blue. And uh, I, I studied, um, it's actually interesting. You know, I, I always knew, 
You know, I, I'm not I'm, I'm not an artist or, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a very uh, basic amateur musician. I never, I, I always knew I'd do something in business. I always had a bit of a practical mindset. And I think you have to be a bit practical in life. So I created a major, I mean, we called organizational psychology, which means that I had a little bit of a business spin to my psychology major when I was in college. Um, and I always worked. When I was in college, I had a couple of businesses on my own. I actually had a business that would make jingles, musical jingles for um, some of the local shops that were in, uh, in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, do you play an instrument or? I would do the whole thing. I would, I would, I would, I would write the jingle. I had a, my, my friend would sell the advertising space. He worked for the Michigan Daily newspaper. Uh, so he had the contacts in the business community. I would write the song for Bell's Pizza or Cottage Inn Pizza, a lot of pizza ads. And uh, I'd record it, my little four track, I'd bring a singer in, we'd sing it, um, and then we'd play it at the local radio station. It was a neat little business we did. I made a lot more money in my other business, which was basically selling t-shirts to freshmen, um, where we would, and it kills me now because I'm such a big believer in intellectual property, we would just knock off designs of other brands and kind of repurpose them for University of Michigan wear. And we'd go to door to door in the freshman dorms and sell them with the added benefit of we got to meet a lot of freshmen, which is yeah. when you're a sophomore <laughs> or junior guy is always a nice thing to be doing. And that was actually quite a nice business too. So always looking for ways to kind of do my own thing even yeah. when I was in college. And it's interesting that you have uh, a psych degree and then how that translates. How, th- how do you think about psych degrees translating to business? I have one as well. I think it actually, business is, people don't really talk about is a lot of understanding the psychology of how humans behave and are incentivized. And sure. how, do you, how do you think about that? Uh, you know, it's interesting. That the, the reason why I kind of had this interesting major was it took basic psychology, basic psychology things, and then it turned it into things like Maslow's hierarchy of needs mm-hmm. and how to motivate people. And there are some kind of human resources, re- management of organizations. And, you know, I, I can't make a direct line in saying, well, I took those school, those classes in college, so it made me uh, good at them. Uh, when I was in business, but it certainly wasn't the first time I was hearing or thinking about, well, I have like, you know, 1.150 employees and you know, I have to deal with all the dynamics between these people and be sensitive and understanding and understand motivations. You know, you have your formal. It, it laid that foundation. Laid that for foundation yeah. for, for sure. I mean, people have professional goals, you have personal goals. You've got to think about both of them in the context of your teams. So I think it really did help lay a foundation for that, for sure. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and I, I think there's it's a big advantage to have that foundation, that experience when going into business, I, I think. 100%. Um, so you then went uh, to what I would like to call the movie montage part of your life. With, uh, <laughs> with uh, You worked at MTV and Pfizer and, and Grey Group um, before going back to, to school. Tell us a little bit about that time and, you know, are there any key takeaways or... You want to fast forward? Uh, no, I, I mean, I, I, you know, I really wanted, I, for some reason, I thought advertising would be a good fit for my skills. I wanted to move back to New York um, after school. Um, and I guess that's a funny story. I actually applied to um, every single advertising agency in New York City uh, for a copywriter job. And this is, you know, basically, this is the first time uh, mere mortals had access to personal computers. So I had my Mac Plus and I was able to do <laughs> like a... Uh, you know, write one letter and change the address and, you know, send out to a hundred different companies. I wrote one letter looking for a copywriter job and I changed, I did the mail merge and sent it out to a hundred different agencies. You name the agency, I sent it to them. J. Walter Thompson, Gray Advertising, Saatchi and Saatchi, all of them got letters from me. Of course, I spelled the word copywriter wrong on the initial <laughs> draft. So looking for a copywriter job and spelling copywriter wrong is a huge fail. <laughs> but after that embarrassment, I, I think I had um, every one on they kind of pointed out copywriter. It's not spelled R-I-G-H-T-E-R. So, um, but but ama- amazingly, I managed to get myself a $15,000 a year job at Gray Advertising, which is low even back then. But I was uh, very excited to get into the world of advertising, and it was it was it was great. I learned a lot in that first job, even though you know it was I was working for a small account group. It was great. That's awesome. Um, so then you went back to school or Steelcase, which comes next. So after I worked for uh, for Gray Advertising for a year, and then I got a job at MTV, and this is a, about their ten year anniversary point. MTV was still a you know cable television. MTV. This was still. This a, is like ninety ninety one. This is ninety one. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, MTV had just had their ten year anniversary party, which I went to, and Prince played. It was quite awesome. Um, I got to go to the REM Unplugged taping live. I was psyched about that too. It was a really cool time. 
And uh, Tom Freston was the CEO of MTV. He was like down the hall from me. I got to meet him. And I do think that had a big impact on me. I mean, MTV was still a very entrepreneurial place. Uh, they had just opened up their 1515 Broadway headquarters. I was here the first day that that, that this building opened up. And it was, it was an amazing experience, actually. Um, I, I had a real job there. But I also knew that I was sort of on this pathway of kind of low management jobs, and I kind of wanted more. And, um, you know, I think like, you know, it, my parents were like, you know, go back to school. I didn't want to do medical school. I didn't want to do law school. But I thought business school would be interesting for me. And I did go to Columbia Business School after I finished at MTV. Well, it's really interesting because I feel like a lot of, a lot of people have these – they're still an employee. They're still not an entrepreneur, maybe, but but it's an eye-opening job where you're like, oh shit, this is this is how a company can be built. Yeah, um, and I think New York, compared to other cities, more more often exposes people to that. Um, and I think you know that that's a really good point. You know, just getting that experience and getting that understanding of of how those big, fast-growing, super scalable, top-of-their-heyday companies are are in those moments. Um, I think that's great. When I went to MTV, it was an interesting time. They were, they were not yet a really, they were, they were big, not yet a very big company. And I, I, you know, even my little part there, I was helping them figure out sort of key things. You, know, they you, were, you were riding the roller coaster yeah. and the rocket. You were rock, riding the rocket up. They, they, yeah, they didn't know how to, for example, track their advertising by day part, which is kind of a basic TV thing today. And it's done manually in Lotus 1, 2, 3. And I was creating Lotus 1, 2, 3 spreadsheets to help them track their <laughs> advertising by day part. Um, but the business school decision was an interesting one. I kind of saw pretty quickly that this was a slow path up the corporate ladder. I mean, I guess you can get lucky. Um, I'm not a huge believer in luck. You can get lucky and impress the right person at the right time and jump a few levels. Um, but I like education. I liked school. Um, and I thought that a faster way to kind of learning more, I was, I was not, you know, I wasn't full of myself. I knew there's a lot I didn't know. And I felt the best way to get to know it quickly wasn't to spend 10 years going up the corporate ladder, but was to get back into a, a good grad program where I could really immerse myself in a lot of topics about business. Nice. So you went to Columbia. Uh, what did you study there for, for your grad? Um, I, I did marketing, I did management, and I also had the very, very first degree in media management. So we were beginning to learn about things then like AOL, TCP IP, you know, using technology for marketing and business on the internet protocol was a pretty new thing, but they were teaching it there. So I kind of saw, oh, this is interesting. I always liked tech as a kid. Um, so I jumped into that program as well. All right. Nice. Um, so coming next, you go to Steelcase. What, what was Steelcase? Steelcase is the world's largest office furniture company. Right. Um, so they're in the, in the world of office furniture, and all these companies are based in East Lansing, Michigan, or that area, in, uh, in, in the Western Michigan area. Um, I'm sorry, Lansing, Michigan. Uh, anyway, uh, Grand Rapids is the headquarters. You have, you have companies like um, Herman Miller. I think everyone's heard of Herman Miller. Mm -hmm. Hayworth. Knoll and Steelcase, those are the four big guys. They're like the auto industry of, of the, uh, like the Ford Chrysler, <laughs> you know, of, uh, of, of office furniture. And it was a very, very big job. But my job was kind of unique. I didn't go to Grand Rapids, Michigan and go work in the headquarters. I actually worked in Soho for a small, fully owned design division that was working on ergonomic products for computers. So what was happening is, this is 1993, and um People are developing things like carpal tunnel syndrome and neck strain and all these problems from computers um, being pretty new to the workplace. I mean, when I worked at advertising, I didn't have a computer. I had an IBM electric typewriter. <laughs> <laughs> so when I worked at MTV, I had a really crummy, you know, black and white CRT. So um, it was pretty new. And we were working with really great design firms like IDEO, which is pretty, they're owned by Steelcase now, and other top design firms to create these super... Um, well-designed um, accessories for computer use, users in the workplace to uh, address things like carpal tunnel, eye strain, neck strain. Um, we were very innovative. It was my first introduction to product innovation, to sort of kind of more sort of higher level marketing, you know, not just advertising, but really kind of selling more advanced products. And uh, I really took to it. It was a really great experience. That, that, that's really interesting, and I'm, I'm actually curious, well, and we'll get to this uh, when we talk a little bit about Skip Hop later, but that kind of reminds me from our previous talk, some of how you've talked about product innovation um, on the on the physical product level with some of what you did at Skip Hop. A hundred percent. I got to visit some of the factories that made our product. We made our products mostly in the U.S. I got to work with the, very closely the product designers. I, I didn't know, you know, obviously I spent a, we'll get to it, I spent a long time in technology before getting back to the product world. Yeah. And I, and I do, I would often say that I was pretty new to products when I got 
got involved with Skip Hop, but this was a bit of an early experience and it, it did have a big impact on me in terms of, you know, designing, developing physical products for the real world. So up next, we have T3 Media. Uh, yeah. This is the, the first company you start? Yeah, so... And what, what is T3 Media? So as, as, as in my personal life, I was always very, you know, I was the, I was, when I was a kid, um, I had an Atari 800 computer. I had a, I had a TRS-80 IBM. I was always the kind of computer guy in my high school. When I was in high school, actually, we would um, we would uh, pirate um, games for our Atari 800. We'd kind of <laughs> try to pirate the games. They used to have cassette tapes of all things, and we would sell them to other kids. So I always liked computers and I always liked tech, but um, if I put it kind of in the back pocket for a while. And um, then sort of in the, in the late 80s, when the whole BBS thing started happening, I got very into sort of, I, was, I had it fascinating. I could take my computer, I could turn it on, I could dial out my modem, I can access servers all over the world, and I can download software, I could see chats. I just, this whole thing just kind of, it sang to me. The, uh, the technology really sang to me. And uh, this is back at the beginning when ISPs first started forming. Um, there was a there was like Phantom in New York for those guys who go back a long time. I had my first email address was a Phantom address, and um, a lot of the you know big time pioneers were just getting started in that world. So when I was at Steelcase, I I, I, I actually was getting uh, bitten in, in the I got the bug personally for this new internet mm -hmm. and. I just, I just, I got obsessed with it. I got obsessed with the fact that you could take a computer and you could attach it to this network and it became sort of like a media property. And I said, I, I'm done with this furniture thing. I need to get into this business somehow. And the first thing I thought about doing was an ISP. I don't know why. I just said, I'm going to do an ISP. It's going to be a big opportunity. One day, you know, I'm one in a thousand people who are logging on to these networks one day, I bet everyone's going to want to do this. People laughed at me. That who's going to want to do that? I, I people thought, laughed at a lot of people. <laughs> people laughed yeah. at me. Um, I ended up. I ended up abandoning that idea. But I had a different idea, and that idea was to put real estate listings on the internet. I said, "Well, there are two kinds of things that advertising that people actually want to see. One thing is women want to see bridal gowns. Maybe I was getting married, so that was on my mind. Women were buying Modern Bride magazine for the advertising. What magazines do you buy for the advertising?" And people were buying newspapers for the real estate listings. So it seemed like this interesting place where you can make the ads for, make the ads the content. So the ads are free and then the advertisers will pay you. So I wrote this business plan to create an online advertising network. And I raised about $100,000 from friends and family. And I launched it not on the internet because that was still, but I launched it on its own kind of BBS, a, a, a graphical BBS using well, what is What is BBS? Uh, bulletin board system. Got it. So um, most BBSs at the time were all text-based, but there was a company that was called First Class that created a uh, BBS that looked like AOL. So um, I set up this real estate listing service. I quit my job at Steelcase. I started driving around and meeting with all the real estate agencies, Corcoran and Halstead and all those guys, and asking, hey, I got the newest tech in real estate advertising. Uh, give me your advertising, and I'm going to send out floppy disks to all the people who need to buy homes, and they're going to install my software and see your ads on my system. Total failure. <laughs> Total <laughs> I, I set it up. I built it. I launched it. I spent a lot of the investor money, um, but I could not get those real estate brokers to part with a buck. <laughs> Ten years. I said, give me a $1 per ad. They wouldn't do it. So it's, it's still really hard today. <laughs> still really hard today. Real estate programs. Are Real still, estate is one of those industries that just does not want to adapt to the internet. Well, it was interesting. You know, that was something I, I I didn't know. I wasn't from that industry. I had this great idea, but I hadn't fully researched the customers and the business models. And I just thought, oh, they're going to love this, and um, and they didn't. But an interesting thing, thing happened. I was one of the only people from my business school class who was involved in anything related to the internet or again, AOL, or as they called them back on home pages. So I started getting calls from some of my fellow classmates. I was two years out of business school saying, Hey, I work for L'Oreal cosmetics. Can you come in here and talk to me about how we put our business, you know, how we do something online. My boss is telling me I got to do something online. What do I do? Um, so prime media, a big magazine publisher came to us. Um, uh, Sony, Sony, Sony Pictures, Sony Films, um, New Line Cinema, all these early clients, eventually American Express, they started coming to me and saying, you're the only guy we know from our class, so can you help us with this? So that's how T3 Media started. I said, well, on Monday, I'm trying to get a real estate broker to give me a buck, and on Tuesday, I'm being offered $100,000 from some big company to build their online presence. Like, what are you going to do? Sometimes you have to follow the money. Yeah. And I... 
I shut down the real estate part of the business and I focused it instead on, um, on building an online agency back when that was a very new thing. So we were starting about the same time as some of the more famous companies like Razorfish is probably the most famous one from that time, but Razorfish, agency.com, Avalanche, Method 5, guys like that were launching their agencies and we were one of those very early New York City agencies. That's awesome. It's, it's interesting how putting yourself out there can lead to you know other directions sometimes and how you have to listen, listen to that. Um, <clears throat> so... Uh, after T3 Media, what, what, what happens with T3 Media? I know you transitioned to iClips. Uh, you know, what is iClips and is T3 turned into iClips or what happens there? So, uh, you know, T3 Media was, I was, it was a really, first of all, it was, I was still pretty, I was a young guy. It was amazing that we would be hired by these really, really big companies as a bunch of young kids, you know, you know young stoners <laughs> hanging out in, uh, <laughs> you know, in sort of these crummy little offices to kind of build their websites for like big financial services companies was sort of nuts. And uh, it was a really great time to be in that business. Um, and we grew it to a quite a nice size. But after about five years, I had a partner, great guy, but there was sort of a difference in opinion on how to run the business. Um, and we had an investor who was looking to come in, um, a public company investor. And I took that opportunity. I said, you know, this is great. But we have a difference in opinion on strategy. So I'm going to take this opportunity to take some cash off the table, take some money. It wasn't, it wasn't a lot of money, but it was, it was good at the time. Take some money off the table, and I'm going to try to do something different. Um, it was 1999. It was sort of the absolute rage of the internet. Like, like it, was, yeah. it was sort of the... You got out at the right time. I got out at the right time. I got into, I got into something new at the wrong time, but it kind of goes together, right? Yeah. So, well, let's, let's jump into that. Yeah. So next up, you create iClips. Uh, it was a streaming video platform. Uh, I've heard you describe this as YouTube before YouTube. Yes. Which can speak a lot to timing of things on the internet and, and, and when when is the right time for technology to emerge. So what what is iClips and, and what happens here? So iClips was, um, you know, it's interesting. When I was at T3 Media, we did a lot of work with streaming audio and video, a lot more than most companies at that time. And we were doing work with streaming audio and video because we had both Cameron McIntosh and Andrew Lloyd Webber as clients. We were basically, the, one, of our, one of our specialties was Broadway shows. We had New Line Cinema. We had a lot of experience with streaming technologies, which were very, very young at that time. Um, but I recognized that streaming video, not only me, but a lot of folks, that was a very powerful tool. And it was about that time that um, iClips and a few other companies all began building sort of uh, interfaces so the the average user could create their videos. They didn't have to come from a camera. You know, you had your little Logitech webcam on your computer. You could record yourself doing something. You know, we could capture it. We could encode it in the back end. We could re-deliver you a link. And then you could take that link in that video and you could email it to people or you can put it on your GeoCities homepage. You got Geo the time we were in. And uh, and create sort of your, and be your own streaming video person. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there are, I would say there are probably four or five companies that were getting funded to do this specific thing. Um, our business was uh, sort of, we had a, um, a Netscape plugin. That's kind of, again, you know, like these old things are no longer around. <laughs> um, and we ended up both having our own branded service at iClips. And we also white labeled the business for people like Yahoo. When you, there was a time when at Yahoo profiles, you could add a photo or a video. Our tools were the video you would add. Um, NBC Interactive was a, was a white label of ours. Homestead, Snowball, a lot of brands that are no longer around anymore. We kind of white labeled their video platform, and we had our own branded video, our own branded platform as well. And we went out and we raised venture capital. We raised we seed money. We raised venture capital. Yeah, and uh, you started this ninety nine. Started in ninety nine. So right at the right at the the height of the boom. Right, and uh, <clears throat> and we and we, we we built a product very quickly. We we uh, rolled it into our. You know, everyone was very enthusiastic about it. It's actually interesting. Talk about timing. You know, I can go back to the business plan for that business and you would never, we never actually realized that people would have video cameras in their phones. So like talk about how times have changed. That one, one of the big things I think that made YouTube, there are many things that made YouTube successful, great management, great team, great product, but also it was the, the ubiquity of having a video camera in your pocket, which actually didn't exist during this first phase of- yeah, People couldn't even fathom it. Where people couldn't fathom it. So you had to have a Logitech camera, 
You know, or you had to be willing to take your, you know, your, your Sony Handycam and re-encode yeah. the videos. Well, and even those early YouTube videos, like, you know, remember, I remember one of the first ones that became really popular was like Lonely Girl 15. <laughs> uh, yeah. And it was this, this viral video of this woman on a webcam in her room, like confessing to the camera. <laughs> but you're right. It was, everyone had these Logitech webcams. Like Num Num Guy. Was that his name again? The, the, Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you're, you're right. Yeah. So it, it was, it, 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 it kind of was really, really exciting. It took off really quickly. Um, and we had a, we had a great team. Uh, and then 2001, 2002 came and really that was sort of the very, very first big dot com crash. Um, pink slip parties in New York City, things like that. And literally, um, all of our partners. So we built the product. We were moving along what, quickly. What did you call it? A pink slip party? Uh, there was a time where uh, <laughs> so this, this is the Web 1.0 days of New York City still, and there were massive. This is when um, uh, my friend Phil Kaplan had this website, Eft Company, and I remember Eft Company, and he had a book, and it was a kind of a Deadpool. So which companies were going to go out of business first? Um, you know, there was, that was that was when people would make fun of you. You'd have Herman Miller chair. All you spend all your venture money on very expensive chairs. It was a very yeah. exciting time. But when the market crashed and the money dried up, a lot of these companies, which didn't really have sustainable models, iClips included, we did not really have a sustainable model. The money quickly vanished, and uh, so there's a massive amount of people let go from work. Pink slips, what you got? It. So <clears throat> we had pink slip parties. Yeah, <laughs> nice. Um, all right, awesome. Well, I want to take a. We're going to take a quick break, but I'm really excited because when we get back from this break, we're going to talk about Skip Hop, which is your next company, which you guys ended up selling to Carter's for 140 million. Um, so we'll be right back with this ambi- this episode of Ambition Today. This is Ambition Today. Thank you for listening to this episode of Ambition Today. Remember to join the A-List, our back channel, to get the single greatest piece of advice our guests have ever received. The price is super founder-friendly. It's only $3. Uh, and visit siscar.co slash A-List to hear Michael's best piece of advice ever after this episode uh, right now. Ambition Today is also happy to partner with the Founder Institute, the world's premier launch stage startup accelerator. We've now graduated over 3,000 technology companies across six continents, and we've learned a lot. And we've used that data to compile the best personality traits of successful founders. These are things like fluid intelligence, openness, conscientiousness, and more. If you think you have entrepreneurial DNA and you want to find out how you stack up with your entrepreneurial personality, uh, then you can visit fi.co slash join slash ambition to apply, take the test, and find out today. If you enjoy the show, don't forget to leave us a review in the Apple, Spotify, Google, Podcast Store, whatever you use. Uh, and now back to this amazing episode of Ambition Today. Visit Ambition Today online at siscard.co and follow the show on social media at Ambition Today. Welcome back. We are here with Michael Diamant, and we are talking about his journey through entrepreneurship before the break. Uh, but Michael, next up we have Skip Hop. This is a, a big company. You worked on this for 13 years. Um, so let's let's talk let's talk about the beginning of it, the genesis of Skip Hop. Why did you start Skip Hop? Sure. Just, uh, just, just go back for one second, just to back with because it goes back to the end of iClips. So yeah, um, when iClips shut down, um, you know we we ran out of money. There was no money to be raised. Um, we laid off our entire team. You know, 35 people. Uh, definitely a low point. Um, you know, you hear about companies going under, but you don't ever expect it to be yours, and it was. So, um, and I actually had invested a lot of my money, a lot of the proceeds from T3 Media into Skip Hop, into iClips, excuse me, into iClips. So I found myself sort of at an interesting situation in life um, where I definitely wanted to be an entrepreneur. I definitely wanted to do my own thing. I really never saw myself going back to a regular job, but there's also the realities. I had a baby at home and a family, and I needed to kind of support my family. So I really kind of felt I had one more, and maybe this is how I felt at the time, but one more entrepreneurial uh, gig in me, one more, I could take one more chance, you know, for the brass ring. And I didn't, but I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, I didn't know I wanted to stay in technology. I'd spent 10 years there as my, my life, had all my contacts, things like that. Um, or if I wanted to go into something totally different. And I looked at a number of different opportunities. Um, I looked at doing, I looked at an online platform for creating um, legal graphics, mm-hmm. interesting business I was looking at. Um, I had a guy who was trying to get me involved in his sort of um, portable, um, I guess, portable, uh, what do you like, power plants that use like nitrogen, I don't know, it's a portable power plant business. Um, and while all this kind of more, what, what maybe you would expect an entrepreneur to do in technology, all these kind of higher tech things are coming up. 
Um, my wife came to me. We had a, we had a baby at home. He is uh, born in the end of, end of 2000s. This is uh, 2002. And she, you know, my wife has spent, has spent her entire uh, career as a designer, uh, not a product designer, but like a, an art director in publishing and magazines. But she had this idea for a product, and that was um, to take a, a diaper bag, which she carried every day with her, and to turn it into a much more functional, innovative product. She added these really cool clips that allowed it to attach to the back of any stroller. It's kind of a, a small little innovation, not a, not a world-changing innovation, but it made it so much easier to use. So now, all of a sudden, you're pushing your stroller around, and your diaper bag goes from being something you carry on your shoulder, which you could still do, to something you attach to your stroller, almost like the trunk of your car. Mm-hmm. And we lived in New York City, and we were always on our feet and pushing our stroller around, and it was a great aha moment for her. And she goes, I designed this really cool product. I kind of made it at home. Uh, I think I could sell these to some of my friends. Um, maybe we should. Maybe you want to do this. And... Um, I thought about it long hard. This is an interesting, interesting area. When you're when you're a new parent, uh, you start spending a ton of money on kid stuff. I mean, it's all you spend money on. You don't spend money on yourself anymore. You defer. You want a new car? Eh, I gotta buy a crib. I gotta buy a stroller. You want a new uh, some new clothing? Eh, I gotta buy a whole wardrobe for my baby. <laughs> so I began to see that. Wait a second. You know, parenting is like an incredible opportunity for as a business opportunity as well as very expensive thing to be doing at the time. And I sort of kind of got into this idea of maybe this is an interesting category to get in. And maybe my wife's little invention here um, it could be much, much more. Um, you know, one of the cool things about the parenting space is that moms and dads research heavily. They get very heavily invested in the products they're going to buy. Even a diaper bag. I mean, these moms and these diaper bags are mostly moms, but strollers could be moms and dads. They will go on message boards and they will look at product reviews and they will like compare and discuss and they will put tons of thought, more thought into their stroller than their car, for sure. You'll look in their car to your dealership and say, oh, I love that car, I'm going to buy it. But you'll never walk into a Bye Bye Baby and just pick a stroller off. You're going to read and research. Yeah. So we like that. So I said, you know what? I'm not into these other businesses. You know, I want to go in the baby products business. Now... My, so, so I just want to stop you for a second because sure. this is a, we were talking before the podcast, and I was, I was speaking with your wife. So the question from her was, uh, and I'm sure she knows the answer, but we'll ask the question on air: is, is you know, you're doing all this tech stuff, right? And then you go to baby products, right? And and from our conversation, it kind of reminds me back to those steel case days. Um, but but why, you know? Well, it's interesting why, you know. For, so I think. Yeah, people have asked me, you know, do you, you know, there's passion comes in many different ways. I obviously, I didn't have a passion for baby products. It wasn't mm-hmm. something that was like kind of bubbling up inside me that I had to do. I had that more for tech, to be honest with you. Um, but I have a passion for learning new things uh, and trying something different. And the un- I love the unknown. Um, I remember walking through a Target with my, with my Do you wife. love the unknown or trying to demystify and figure out the unknown? Trying to <clears throat> demystify and figure out the unknown. Yeah. And the night, and then one thing that I was about to say that occurred to me, look, it's not like Elon Musk building rocket ships. That's a whole other level of unknown that, you know, the average mere mortal can't get involved in. <laughs> um, but you can walk around a Target and say, you know, not everyone here is a rocket scientist. People are figuring this stuff out, you know, in their garages. They're figuring it out in their basements. And, I think we could figure. We're pretty smart. We know branding. You know, I, 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 we, we have a real appreciation for product design and innovation. You know, I have a marketing background. I understand product differentiation. I understand communication and education. You know, I think we could do a pretty good job here. And um, a lot of my friends in tech, when they heard I was going from like you know, you know, fancy, sexy tech to the diaper bag business, they're like, "You're out of your mind." Um, but um, we, I mean, you could make the same case for Elon, though. I mean. He, the, I know it's cars, right? But at the time, cars weren't tech, you know? True. Uh, it, it was the applying these principles of high-growth, scalable companies to these newer industries, and I think there's a lot of value in that. Uh, thank you, 100%. Yeah. Um, I think for us, I think we, we were, we, I got passionate about this unknown. It was also a very... So, so yeah, so you, so you built these bags. Yeah. So what happens to these bags? So, well, first of all, we, we did the bags, but just for me to go a little bit more into, for, for the listeners who are interested, yeah. uh, in, in, the, in the environment in that, every, every business category you're in goes through different kind of ups and downs in terms of innovation. And this is like 2003. 2003. For whatever reason, I, I, this is sort of um, environment beyond my control. In the world of baby parenting, baby products and gear, there was actually a transformation going on. Um, the transformation was kind of parents, their expectations were, were, were 
going much higher in terms of what they expected from their products. You know, I call it the OXO effect. You know, OXO. What's that? OXO is a brand like I, I, OXO is a brand like like uh, like Dyson. People okay. expected a lot more from their vacuum cleaner than they used to get. They would buy a Dyson. OXO is a brand that makes um, kitchen products. You know, for the kitchen that kind of were elevated well above the potato peeler your mom used to have. And that sort of was hitting baby products. I, I think with entrepreneurs like my wife and I, um, parents wanted more. So this um, very famous stroller came out. If you have kids, you may have heard it called Bugaboo. The Bugaboo was the first thousand dollar stroller, super high tech, great materials. It had tons of function. It wasn't just kind of a chair on wheels. It was kind of the- It was the Tesla of the strollers. Tesla of strollers, exactly. <clears throat> and a lot of that was beginning to happen in the industry when we entered. Um, probably partly coincidence and partly just, you know, na a natural kind of ebb and flow of the industry. So with this diaper bag, we actually saw, well, you know, it's not just diaper bags. We can really apply the, the, the theories of product design, innovation, functionality, you know, value, you know, design, designing things would offer more value for lower price into many, many categories. And then that passion for the unknown and learning, you combine it with that and we said we can we can we just don't have to do diaper bags. We can do diaper bags. We can do feeding. You know, the world of parenting is a world of basically every product your baby needs to live across multiple categories. You know, if if you have the balls to go there, if you're willing to say, you know, I just I'm, I'm willing to learn something new, you can move into many many different products. And I think the industry when we started Skip Hop, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I think they were kind of shocked that went, oh, I mean, you went from diaper bags, now you're doing feeding, now you're doing this, now you're doing that. But we never saw ourselves as just a diaper bag brand. We saw ourselves as a brand that was going to innovate the world of parenting products. Yeah, most most great entrepreneurs that, that I've met, they they under they understand the brand, right? And they right. understand that they have this longer vision for the brand. We had one of the earlier episodes. We had Rob Prince on. He created Scratch Media. Rob Prince. Yeah, yeah, with, with Jam Master J, <laughs> and um, he always talks about how the the brand was just so much more, and we had this big vision. Uh, but you got to start somewhere. Hundred percent. And then you're going to do something else, and do something else in the evolution of it. So, um, one of the things that impressed me was Skip Hop, and you know, entrepreneurs these days, I think everyone wants to start a company. It's sexy, but they don't necessarily understand the, the long haul they're getting themselves into. You guys ran this for, for 14 years. Yeah, 15 years. Yeah. yeah. Tell us a little bit about that journey and, and what advice you would have to other founders to understand that, you know, you got to be in this for the, for the, for the haul. Yeah. It's, it's, um, we, we, first thing we did was we, I know when we started the company with the first diaper bag, it's kind of like give you a little quick story. We, we designed this great product and it had a couple of things that made it unique. It had this cool function that allowed it to attach to a stroller. That's a very common function in that very small class of products today. Um, we also changed the look significantly. So back then the look was very um, babyish, teddy bears, gingham, Winnie the Pooh, and we created a much more sophisticated product um, that would appeal you know, I think people were very into messenger bags back then, a very messenger bag look to it. Um, and we basically took our really interesting product to a trade show. Um, my wife and I have good branding experience. We kind of built a brand around it. The brand was called Skip Hop. Deliber deliberately did not call it Skip Hop diaper bags or this or that. Well, we already knew this, is, this could be big. Let's have a name that isn't, it's not too baby. It's not, it's just kind of a name that could encompass a lot of things that have to do with enjoying parenting, skipping, hopping. It makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, you know, at that trade show, you know, uh, retailers kind of, they, they, they love the product. Um, we took a lot of orders that first day, you know, it's, it's kind of the basic way to start a business. And we started ordering more and more inventory. Um, and that was how we got, kind of got adoption for the product initially. Yeah. So, um, so what happens? The 14 years go yeah, by. So 14 and years and what, go what by. Happens? So, um, I guess the first thing we did was, you know, once one product was successful, we immediately created like a product pipeline. Here's the kind of products we want to go into. And we started building products in multiple different categories. Um, we wanted to be a multi-category business. We wanted every category to have a, an assortment of products in that category. But then there's also the kind of financial realities of the business. So um, we had certain goals for ourselves. We said we had to like, if we didn't hit $100,000 in sales the first year, we probably were going to walk away, which we, we beat that. And we had like a million dollars in sales in the second year, we beat that. Um, we found ourselves very constrained for capital. Um, so we went out after about three years and we did a friends and family capital raise, um, professional angels. And it was a pretty small raise at the time. It was about a million, $1.6 million. Um, but that gave us sort of the, you know, it's kind of the shark tank round. <laughs> you know, people walk out of shark tank and say, I need to, you know, I, I have target knocking on my door. I have babies rust knocking on my door. You know, I need the capital to support this business to buy the inventory. And that's what that, um, that led us to. 
Um, and then it was a slog, like I said, in terms of how, you know, we just, we continue to, you know, the, the more product successes you have with your brand and the better job you do kind of associating your brand with those successes, the more your customer will trust you with new products. And we did a really, really good job building trust with our retail partners and our consumers. I should add, this is mostly a wholesale business at the time, not a direct consumer business. And, um, you know, we when th then moved sort of a, from, a, from an equity standpoint to a debt standpoint. And I kind of recommend this to a lot of companies who are in the product business, that when you start having inventory and receivables, you don't really need to raise money from investors anymore. You can then go and borrow money from the banks. And we relied heavily on debt for the next five or six years to build the business. Nice. Um, well, congratulations. I know yeah. you sold the company yeah. um, to Carter's. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? <gasps> sure. So, I, I, um, what, 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 before we get to the Carter thing, a little yeah. bit more, a couple yeah. of things that we did, the, the brand sort of became this multi-category brand, um, basically a brand you could find in any retailer. You could find it at Target, Babies R Us, Bye Bye Baby, Nordstrom, Whole Foods. We really had a very wide retail distribution. You'd be surprised the places you can buy baby products. Yeah. Um, and and I, I have a lot of friends that have kids and, I, you know, Skip Hop shows up in their, you know, in the in the crate in the corner. And yeah, for it, sure. It's everywhere. Yeah. It's, ev it's everywhere. Um, and it's also around the world. We also kind of did a really good job of um, building a global distribution. So th this, you know, this become, the, the brand really begins to become um, much more resistant to um, sort of the ups and downs of the market when you have a global business, when you have a multi-category business, when you're a multi-channel multi, multi -channel business. And we're always thinking about how can we make this business one where no one shock the system could ever really hurt it very much. And that was a lot of work, a lot of work over 15 years to create a business that could was in multiple categories, multiple channels, and global distribution points. Um, we actually did a private equity round at one point. I don't know if you want to talk about it at all, but we we did a okay. we did a majority. We we actually you know, there comes a point. You know, consumer products is a great industry to be in, but it's a very hard industry to actually get money out of. <laughs> if you're if you're an entrepreneur, if you walk around trade shows with these kind of small companies that are building product businesses, um, the founders typically they're not taking a lot of money out because all, all the free capital it's all going to inventory, it's all going to receivables, it's all going to growth. So you can look at a business and say, wow, what a successful brand these guys are building. You know, they've been in it for eight, nine years, so successful. But I bet those founders aren't taking a lot of money out of that business because there's just not free cash washing around in that category. So that's where private equity comes in. For some founders, they say, look, you know, I'm a certain age, you know, I'm, I got private school for my kid, I got realities to deal with. You know, I think I need to take some liquidity or some risk off the table. And that was our private equity transaction. We had a great, great partner we worked with. Once you do private equity, you're sort of setting yourself up for the final sale because private equity, they're coming in and they have like a four or five year time frame. They're like, well, you know, now what? We need to get our money out somehow. Um, and I think for Ellen and I, you know, we kind of sort of 15 years as being a lot of time to have done one thing. Mm -hmm. We mentioned at the beginning of this is kind of passion for the unknown. This is becoming very, very known. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, you've explored everything. Explored <clears throat> everything, every angle, you know, about manufacturing and design, distribution. So the timing of the private equity and the ultimate sale really also began to align a bit with the timing of um, us saying, you know, Life. we need something new. Yeah. We get, get passionate about in a different way. Um, and we got, ultimately, you know, we wanted a great partner who would be able to take the brand and bring it to the next level and, and leave a nice legacy. Uh, Carter's, uh, who acquired us, is an incredible brand. They've been around for 150 years. Um, they, own, they own Carter's, they own Oshkosh, two of the great, great American brands. What a better place to have a partner with for, you know, selling your company than someone who has legacy brands like that and can and continue to manage new legacy brands. Yeah. So um, also they're, they're, they're experts in apparel and kids, the largest brands in the world for apparel and kids, but they don't make anything we make. They didn't make any of the accessories or the baby products, but we had the same customer. So it really was kind of a dream a dream yeah. partnership. So uh, I have two more questions for you. One of them, I, I, I you know, you were at Founder Institute recently and you talked about the the meticulousness and the, the methodical nature of how you guys would create these products. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you used the example of the... Um, the uh, spout cover. The spout cover, no, the, yeah. the head, head rinser with the... Head rinser, right, yeah, right. yeah, for, for babies in the bathtub. Um, how would, what advice would you have to other entrepreneurs who are maybe trying to you know figure out product market fit or, or figure out these products? How did you go about it for those listening at Skip Hop really quickly? Um, and what advice would you have for other entrepreneurs? So I'll, I'll give you a, a, two quick answers because yeah. we, we, we came up with our very, very first diaper bag. 
this is kind of before we had a, you know, a hundred plus people, you know, who are really helping us build this brand, um, great team members, just Ellen and myself in our house. And um, we took this kind of initial sample we made and we actually brought it to stores. We said, hey, you know, can we show you this kind of cool product we're making and we get some feedback on it. And that feedback we got from going to retailers and other moms just on our own, that was invaluable. Um, we also are very, very focused on retail price point. I tell all folks getting into consumer products that they have to know what their ultimate retail price is. And if they mess it up, they will mess up their business. So um, we knew we had a price target. We knew we had to hit it. You know, we confirmed that with the stores, consumers. And that was how we did it the first time around. Um, when we were much larger, we would certainly do focus groups. We would do surveys. We would bring, bring parents in. We would bring kids in. Um, we just didn't make a product and send it to the marketplace. Um, we would bring in. Now, sometimes the research, we'd, we'd usually listen to the research. There is this famous saying that if you, that Henry Ford has, where if they ask consumers what they'd want, they say a faster horse. Mm -hmm. Nobody knew they really wanted a car. There's a little bit of truth in that. Sometimes your product is so different and so interesting that you can't really always expect people to understand it. You just got to put it in the market, you know, put and pray. Just put it in the market and you got to pray. And what would be an example of that? <clears throat> well, um, a, a good example of that for us would be, um, sometimes usually that it's on the price point. So I, I got to give you a great example. Um, okay. One of our, one of the best selling skip hop products is our version of the activity center, which is sort of like a, an extra saucer. You put a kid in, and they can spin around in it and play with different toys before they can walk, and it keeps them very busy. And uh, typically it costs seven or eighty dollars. We created one that had a much longer lifespan, so it would turn into a uh, into a table, an activity table, and a play table, and you can actually use it for three years. But it was one hundred and twenty dollars. It was forty dollars more than the competition. So if you kept saying to mom, would you spend 80 bucks, would you spend 120 bucks for an activity center? They'd say, no, I can buy the one from another brand for 80. Why would I pay 120 for yours? But when they began to understand that, wow, this doesn't last for six months, it lasts for three years and it replaces three other products. I'm actually getting a great deal at 120. Um, that was something the market, we, we believed in so much that even though the survey results, their buyers are like, I'm a little scared. I don't think moms are gonna pay 120 for this when they can buy one for 80. Especially, especially like a Target where they're very price sensitive, rightly so, yeah. um, ended up that moms did get it. They got it. They got the value. This innovation of long lifespan, three in one was very valuable. Well, and you, you made a better product. Made a better product. But, but, they, but, the, but the buyers didn't get it. They, weren't, they were not willing to kind of, on a survey, they would say too expensive. Right. Um, so sometimes you got to go, you got you to just believe it. They don't really understand it and you let the market decide. Nice. Um, well, one of my last questions, uh, you know, sometimes at Founders Institute or, or around you see founders that want to start companies with their significant other. You yep. did it. Mm -hmm. 15 years, grown sold. What, what advice, um, and, and maybe it's not even like a, you know, a tech or a big company, right? But maybe it's, you know, a real estate business or some, some family business or something, right? What, what advice would you have, whether it's from seeing your dad and your grandpa and now, you know, being married with your, uh, with your business partner, what advice would you have for anyone that wants to do work with a significant other? Um, yeah. Uh, so it's, 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 uh, it worked out very, very well for us. Um, and I think the reason, the secret why we're so, we were so successful at it was we had very different responsibilities in the business and um, complete trust in the other one to execute their responsibilities to the, as great as they could be executed by anyone else out there. And the example is, you know, um, Ellen's responsibility was really kind of the product portfolio. By the way, the most important part of the business, let's just be frank here, is the product <laughs> portfolio. You know, you know, I was I moved the boxes, I like to joke. You know, I handled sales, operations, finance, sort of supply chain, um, relationships with the factories, but the products that represented the brand, you know, that was really her responsibility and her, her and her team. She had an amazing team. Um, and I think that division of responsibilities um, made it great. Um, I, you know, I, I don't, I, you know, she would show me seven different patterns and say, which do you like the best? And I said, I, I don't know. I mean, I, they all look good to me. It's not my <laughs> expertise. I certainly can appreciate good design when I see it, but the level of detail you need to go to, to be successful here is beyond my, my capacity. And I know she had complete confidence in me to keep the business growing, funded, financed. You know, so I like to say I would make a bubble around her so she could do her thing and not let all the alarms and, and you know, all that stuff come in and affect her. And I would out there, be out there fighting the alarms. That division of responsibility and appreciation of it, you know, 
I didn't, if I was upset over something going wrong in the business, like I didn't need her to get upset about it too, to complete me. I right. people like, you know, <clears throat> why aren't you more upset about it? That's my problem to deal with this. But I didn't get upset about the product issues. She handled those perfectly and she had her own fires to deal with that I don't even know about now. So I think that's the key. Yeah, tr- trust a clear division. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's very important. Awesome. Well, Michael, this has been an amazing episode. Um, if, for those listening, the show notes, which include everything we talked about, will be up on the website, syscar.co. If you enjoyed this episode, please text it, share it uh, with a friend. We truly appreciate it. Um, Michael, thank you for coming on. Where can people go find out more about you? Blog, Twitter, website, anything you want, <laughs> anything you want to plug? Um, I, I, you know, I'm, 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 I've been out of the company for seven months right now, and I have not yet created my, my personal personal place on the internet. Um, okay. So, Are you on um, Twitter or LinkedIn? I, I, or? I mean, you can find me on LinkedIn, of course. You can find me on LinkedIn at, um, at uh, my, Michael Diamant, D-I-A-M-A-N-T. Um, I'm, I'm around other various social media. If you search for me, you'll find me. Um, you know, I, I, I do think I need to, so tell me, I need to create this page. I need to create a personal profile page. Don't I, I'll, I'll help you with this. All right, good. Thank um, you. All right. Awesome. Well, let's take this over to the A-list. Uh, we're going to go hear the best piece of advice you've ever received for those members of the back channel and everyone else. Stay curious. We will see you on the next episode of Ambition Today. Thanks for listening to Ambition Today. Be sure to visit syscar.co to get all the information from this episode and more great content. Until next time, stay curious, everyone.